Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I'm Sherry Goodman, Director of Education uh, here at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. And I'm truly delighted to welcome you to the 2024 Li Jin Lecture, which is going to be presented by artist Yi Ilan. Uh, it's occasioned by or in tandem with uh, Ilan's really wonderful mural, uh, Tikar Meja Plastique, which is on view uh, presently. And I'm sure you glimpsed it as you came in, and hopefully we'll have a little time to take it in uh, after the talk. Um, and I also want to mention that uh, the art wall was <clears throat> curated by our Phyllis C. Wattis uh, senior curator, uh, Victoria Sung. So the BAM PFA annual endowed Legion Distinguished Lecture invites artists and scholars to share their views and knowledge about both traditional and contemporary art from China as well as from other parts of Asia. Today's presentation, the third of the museum's Li Jin lectures, offers the opportunity to learn about the practice of an important and vibrant artist from Borneo, and for a fuller view of the region's visual arts landscape, the work of three Borneo-based filmmakers as well. Our heartfelt appreciation to Vinnie Miller and the Li Jin Foundation for making this event possible. Thank you, Vinnie. <laughs> and thanks also. <laughs> to uh, Victoria Sung for inviting Yi Ilan to create uh, Tika Meja Plastique uh, for the museum. So a brief bio. So Yi Ilan was born and currently lives in Kota Kinabalu, Sabah, Malaysia. Recognized for her predominantly photo media based work, Ilan creates digital photo collages that delve into the evolving intersection of power, colonialism, and neocolonialism in Southeast Asia. She also makes collaborative work with sea-based and land-based communities in Sabah, as with Tikar Meja Plastique, that focus on counter-narratives or, quote, histories from below. Elon has exhibited widely in Asia, Europe, and now the United States with her BAM PFA art wall. Recent solo and group exhibitions include the Ayala Museum, Philippines, the Aichi Triennial, the Istanbul Biennial, the Guangzhou Biennial, and the exhibition Unravel, the Power and Politics of Textiles in Art, currently on view at the Barbican, London. She also has a presentation, excitingly, at the 2024 Venice Biennale, opening later this month. <laughs> I'd just like to add more personally that Ilan has been so very generous and wonderful with her time uh, working with or talking with students both in and outside the classroom uh, in the last few days. And uh, everyone has found her so engaging and, and wonderful. And I'm, I expect that you will also. <laughs> so I'd just like to welcome uh, Ilan to Berkeley and to the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, thank you to Bamfer for having me, and especially Vinny for this, this opportunity to speak with the Legion lecture series. It's a thrill to be here. Um, so, yes, I'm from Kota Kinabalu, Sabah, from the island of Borneo, which I think of as the heart of the world. So uh, I thought I'd start with geography and with textile arts. This is Batik. It uses a, a Google satellite imagery to map not so much the land of Southeast Asia, but its seas, the corridor region, the, 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 the fluidity of where I come from. So if you look closely, you can just see sort of the top of Australia. Um, Borneo is in that cluster in the middle, and then there's a tiny bit of sort of Mexico, Easter Island. These oceans that uh, appear in this map, down to Africa, Madagascar, this is the maritime world of Southeast Asian people, uh, the, which has a you know, millennia long uh, history of negotiating the world via the seas. Um, and I put it through a batik process, uh, batik crackle in particular, Batik is, is a, um, probably the most famous of the textile arts from Southeast Asia. It's been politicized in some ways. Uh, it's used by politics. 
um, and I find it quite fascinating for those reasons. Uh, but batik itself is wax and resist, where there's uh, where the wax resists and where cracks happen, dye is allowed in. And I think of this osmosis kind of process as uh, the people of Southeast Asia, there's this uh, constant negotiation of, of what you hold out and what you allow in, uh, sort of resist and die. Um, and this frenetic energy of, of movement, the, the sort of trans, pre-transnational, pre-national pre trans movement of ideas and sharing. Um, and the textile arts, very importantly, are largely from uh, the women communities of Southeast Asia. So if we read Southeast Asian histories, when we read textiles, we're reading women's stories and, and, and women's uh, interpretations of the world. And I think that that's a really important thing to consider when we read textile arts, and why I also have, have um, a great interest to learn what women were thinking back in the day, you know? So, so um, I thought I'd start with this map just to orientate that I come from a, a world of ocean, of corridor region, of constant exchange between great empires of China, the Arab world, of Africa, um, India. Uh, so then I thought I'd throw this one in. I love to bombastically say, us Bonians, we invented art. <laughs> the oldest figurative cave paintings in the world, 40 to 50,000 years old, is from my island of Borneo. So within that context of that trajectory of storytelling, of making, of expression, that I have this, like I feel a, a, a continuity with the need to, to, to partake in that maritime exchange of, of osmosis between the sea and the land, are all these people and all these stories that are often not told or forgotten or disregarded in this maritime island part of the world. These are clips from the Smithsonian Museum. And then to try and enter this region via both the sea and the land, how, how do we talk about our contemporary societies? How do we, how do we express our ideas? Um, we've got a long tradition of it. We invented art in my mind. I remind ourselves to have that confidence in expression, right? Um, I know it's bombastic, but it's helpful and it's reassuring that we've been doing this for a really long time. Yeah. And it's a buffalo and a, a boar that are in these figurative paintings. And I just love the water buffalo. It's my favorite animal. Um, my play company is called Gurbao Works. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's an animal very dear to me. So just going sort of contemporary society, maybe you could consider starts with the colonial period. So I'm dipping a little bit into this because it informs so much of, of my work personally and, and specifically in relation to Tika Major Plastic on the, the art wall from Bam the Bamford art wall. And I had this incredible life-changing workshop in Langeng Foundation in Yogyakarta with uh, uh, Ale Dr. Ale Dr. Alexander Supatono from um, Edinburgh University, where he invited 10 of us artists to, to look at you know, thousands of colonial imagery um, of Dutch Indonesia. Um, and after looking at thousands and thousands of photographs, he wanted us to read the images and to, to kind of see what we could see as a collective of these 10 artists. And what struck me so fundamentally was the table, this table that was present in so many images, the table of the surveyor, the map maker, the table, and also the, 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 um, the office, but the table of education, all of industry and economics, um, of the census, of the museum, what is worthy to be collected and what is not? What are the stories that need to be um, highlighted? Uh, what is photography? What is, you know, to measure the shape of your nose with those ethnographic type uh, 
uh, early images. So um, this was kind of a life-changing moment for me when I realized with that question of how do you colonize someone, it wasn't necessarily through the overt violence of warfare and the gun. It was something far more insidious, which was the table where I shall tell you who you are. And when I tell you who you are, I'm not just telling you, I'm telling your future grandchildren. I'm telling you for future times, for, for in a shape that cannot be defined. I am telling you who you are, what your land is. I'm giving you a border. I'm giving you a passport. All of this becomes this incredible assertion into your very existence. And to me, that is what colonialism is. And to find, to decolonize for me is to see where the tables are and to recognize systems of power, systems of organizing you and your existence and your knowledge systems. So this is from a series called Picturing Power that came from that workshop with an army of tables. The army, because I work in photo media a lot, um, I, I include um, the camera within that narrative of a, a tool of potential violence. And then the other thing that I discovered in this process of looking at a thousand images more was scale. How the scale of land use changed uh, during the colonial period. The first monocrop was sugarcane um, out of Indonesia. And I think the, the US histories of colonialism can relate very closely with how monocrops change society. Now, after, after sugarcane, the, the big one was rubber. And after rubber was um, what we have now, which is oil palm. And what, what, what this monocrop does, it changes scale and when it, and of land use. And when it changes scale of land use, everything changes, society changes. Uh, in my community, in the Kadaza and Dusun people of Sabah, the interior land people, um, women were the agriculturalists and women were the economic keepers of the society because they're the ones that you see at the marketplace. They're the ones selling the rice. So when you have a massive monocrop that, that enters into the landscape, what it is is a blanket. It, it, it blankets and covers society. It blankets over women's traditional roles. And suddenly everything changes with that when women are no longer the, the agriculturalists where the, the, it is not their labor that works in these large um, um, estates. And here's the buffalo again. So in a, in a, in a I've, I've had a long history of enjoying and participating in protests. Um, I think it's okay to say that at Berkeley. <laughs> um, and I, and you know, where does that energy come from when you, this recalcitrance towards power and this desire to partake and to disrupt the street and to, to, to engage in the storytelling and to tell your story and to claim your space. So I think of very, very much as the street as having this, this life that 40,000 years old, we've been, you know, making our mark, right? So um, the Buffalo. And this is called billboard. It is a billboard, uh, nine feet by 30 feet, a huge billboard. Um, so I lived 20 odd years in Kuala Lumpur, the capital city of Malaysia. And then in 2016, 2017, I moved back to Sabah, kind of in a floundry of trying to find, because it was depressing seeing the table everywhere. And I didn't know how to address the table. This table was became this all-encompassing fierceness that I couldn't, once you see the matrix, you're kind of stuck in it, looking at the matrix every day, going, oh my God, this table. Um, and I ran home to Sabah, um, and I, going through again archival images, um, I found my grandmother's mat. So the top left corner is, uh, the girl being lifted is my sister, and I'm sitting next to her. 
my grandmother is, uh, you see her face by the door, and we're sitting on a bundusan mat, the, the kind of mat that my uh, grandmother used to weave. This is a Namagavao uh, harvest festival ritual as part of the, um, uh, in her village, Kampong Nambazan in Sabah. That's my mum from New Zealand standing in the second picture. But what I wanted to point out here was when I discovered the mat, I asked my father, you know, I have this memory of my grandmother weaving mats. I said, you know, what did she weave? And he, you know, he kind of rolled his eyes at me and said, yeah, yeah, she used to weave mats. I said, what kind of mats? What plant did she use? Uh, and uh, I always tell this story because it was so shocking to me. He said, Bundusan. And I said, Bundusan? Bundusan is the name of a highway um, that more or less connects my uh, grandmother's village to our capital in Sabah, Kota Kinabalu. And I only know it as the name of a highway. I thought, I thought Bundusan is a highway. It's a, it's, Bundusan, the highway, is now in this landscape that used to be paddy fields and now has uh, become semi-industrial. Um, and there's no more paddy fields. And he said Bundusan was like a, this reed that grows on the side of paddy fields and is, is, is uh, like a weed almost, uh, this reed. Um, and I, oh, oh, okay, I didn't know that. Uh, and then I went to try and find the plant or an object or a person who knew how to weave that, treat that, process that plant, and I couldn't find anyone. And this was shocking to me. So suddenly I realized that we're losing our knowledge. And these really, in, even in my own family, in these really tangible ways, I was ignorant of what my grandmother used to do. And um, it sent me down on this whole journey that brings me to you. Yeah. Um, but the, the mat, um, as you can see exampled here, is shared the top row are from the land people, the Kadazan, Doso, and Morot of Sabah. And mm -hmm. the bottom three images are from the sea-based people, uh, the, the Bajau, Bajolau, Samadalau. Uh, these ones in particular are from Samporna. The, the wedding photo is um, from my community that I work with in uh, Pulau Omadal. Um, I just wanted to point, and then looking at these images and starting to read the mat, um, it's a it's a portal to so much. It's just it's been incredibly um, um, it's been an education. It's incredibly stimulating. Uh, you will see in the bottom row it more clearly. Uh, plain mats are used in ritual. Um, colorful mats, pattern mats, where you show off your cultural heritage, um, are shown at. Uh, uh, are displayed particularly in things like weddings where they become part of dowry um, in celebratory occasions. But the mat, what is the mat? You, your parents made you on the mat. You were born on a mat. You lived your entire life on the mat. You worked, slept, ate, everything was on a mat. Um, and then when you died, your, your body was, was rolled in a, in a tikar um, and uh, uh, you are buried in a mat. So the, the mat becomes like the skin of society. It is, it is ordinary and ignored. When people travel, uh, when students travel, often um, you, when you leave home, you have an electric rice cooker and you have a mat. And, and that's what you venture out into the world with. Um, so um, the mat is it's so ordinary, it's, it's, it's ignored. Um, I should point out also that the, the word major table in Malay, mesa in Tagalog of the Philippines, comes from the, the, the Portuguese and Spanish word for table, which is mesa. Prior to the colonial period, there were no tables. Everyone sat on the mat. The mat, the tika, it has a hundred names. Every community has their own name for a mat. So unpacking the mat, um, um, as an object, an uh, entry point, a portal to knowledge systems in that, in that search to balance um, the table um, has, has, um, has become a really rich um, um, endeavor and methodology even as an artist. Uh, the image, you know, the hauntings of the table, the shadow of the table is something that I always think about. 
I'm not saying that all tables are bad, not at all. I'm recognizing what they are, the power that they hold. And the mat to me contains another power. Um, so to me, to, to decolonize is to see the table and to see the mat, often in tandem, operating with their own powers simultaneously, and to recognize different power systems, to be multilingual in your understanding of power um, and the sources of power. So the image, for example, with the, with this is part of a seri uh, seven chapter series called Measuring Project. Um, this is chapter one. Uh, the series looks at also at notions of value, of how do, what does value mean? Is it purely monetary? Um, I don't think value means money. Um, often it is, is reduced to that. Um, the image with the, the roof, the central pillar in a family home is called the Tiang Sri. Nene Moyang, ancestor, is a female term, female connotations. Uh, to gather at the mat, to commune at the mat. The mat is a platform. The, the mat as a, a space that, that calls people together, that can be activated together. Uh, for Tika Major Plastic, um, they, th some of the making of images. So we plant pandanos on the island to, to um, um, as, as where, where the coastal areas are eroding, we plant pandanos to, to, to protect the coastlines. Uh, this is Machi Bilong. Um, uh, Tika Major Plastic uses plastics harvested and collected from the sea, which I think of as a, um, and, and it's the kind of a net of plastic on the wall outside. And I think of this as sort of the net of capitalism, an economic power that, that overrides our other power systems. So what has become really important to my practice as an artist is to think through circular economies, restorative, regenerative principles. These are some of the weavers, Katsana. Um, so Kat Budi is in the red, and then the stripe is Katsana and Kat Rosia. And these are some of the children. Um, some of them, some of my collaborators are nine years old, um, working with their mums. And it has been really important process because, you know, like most children with heritage arts, they say, oh, it's boring, I don't want to do that. Um, so when we pull them into these projects, they're also learning, because this is the natural way also, they learn from their mothers. So when we, when we talk and engage, um, there's a whole lot of things that are happening together. And initially I was, I also need to learn myself how to collaborate. Initially when I was working with the community, I was um, giving them tables, shapes of tables to, to weave into the mat. And then I realized I was being dictatorial in my language. And when I, when I handed over the power in a way to the children, let's do a survey of the tables on the island, um, everything changed. And their understanding of the table also changed. So the collaborative process became much more enriching uh, within the community themselves uh, to look at uh, powerful um, power in their community. They're largely a stateless community. So there's tables from the school uh, on the island that they can't attend because only Malaysian students can attend that. So the table has all these really embedded powerful meanings within the community. The little detail there is the plastic that you saw earlier. These are mats that you'll see on the wall. This is my gang on the island. Um, their water village is in the background, uh, built on um, sh shallow, uh, with the, when the tide goes out, you can see the sand under the houses. Uh, it's, uh, there, I think there's like three or four Malaysians in this photo and the rest are, are, are stateless, undocumented, nomadic sea peoples in, that have traveled and negotiated these seas for a thousand years. And when our borders came in through colonialism, those borders just happened fairly randomly, actually. And then they just fell out of that border. So the table didn't see them. They didn't get um, identity papers. They, they, don't ex they don't have paper identity. They don't, they don't exist. Um, so the part of this project has been about uh, celebrating the richness of cultural 
heritage identity versus paper identity. This is the wall outside. Um, also with the mat, um, I use the mat as a mat. This is a tika emoji made with the kids during COVID. So when nobody had work because there's no tourism, uh, where there's no tourism, there's no seafood restaurants. So um, we, we, we went into war mode weaving. We did so much weaving during COVID when everyone was at home. And the idea with these uh, public engagements on the mat is the mat is collecting shadows and energy of those that are called together, those that commune. When you commune, you rub off on each other, you share energy. And these mats are holders of that. That's why they're so embedded in our home. They, 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 they are our home. Um, just very quickly, yeah. Um, other ideas that I've uh, worked alongside these ideas of the mat is the tamu. The tamu is a pre-colonial market uh, that is found in most societies, but I love the tamu in Sabah. It's where the, the woven uh, image there is a map. So it's where the people from the, the mountains and the hills may meet people from the, the plains, uh, like my grandmother who grew rice, would meet people. It would, the, the marketplace, the tamu, was always found next to a river, which is our highway, of course. So it would bring all the people from the different geographies, from the sea, the mountain, the jungle, the, the plains, where they would go in search of someone who was not you. You go, my grandmother did not go to the tamu to, to buy rice. She went to the tamu to buy salt from the sea people. And the sea people went to the tamu to buy uh, rice. So the point of the matter is that our, our natural meeting place was to meet someone who is not you. Someone who has different ideas, different geography, different products, different knowledge, where you will fall in love, where you will fight, where life happens. Um, so the tamu to me, the concept of looking for someone who is not you has become really important to me. When you open, oh, I think I have it here. When you open those box, the, the, the colonial census of putting people in a census to count people, when you open those boxes, you make a mat, like a cardboard box. You open a cardboard box, they become a, a really important mat to people, right? And the idea where you open, you make space for people, you call someone who's not you to commune together. And the, the other uh, line of thinking in terms of my methodologies as an artist, I think of myself as an ampersand or an and, a bridge, a conjoiner, uh, black and white, male and female, land and sea, to always be trying, striving to, to join things that may or may not um, be paired together. And to me, that has become really important to me. Um, this is with the land community. This is made from bamboo. The sea community work with the colorful pandanus. The, the, the inland community work with bamboo. Um, this, has be, this is called the, the Tukat Kad sequence. Tukat Kad is um, the name of a weave that's a very basic weave that looks like a step. And when I was talking, a lot of the work I do, I think of it as linguistics as well. When I was first talking to them about this basic weave, Tukat Kad, what does this mean? Tukat Kad, apa itu Tukat? Oh, macam, when you're the roof of your, they were describing it to me, what that word means. Um, it's like when you eat something too hot, too cold, too acidic, the roof of your mouth, the ridges on the roof of your mouth become more pronounced. And I was like, oh my God, a trigger site between the deeply personal and the public, the gateway between what you consume and what you vomit out, the site of activation, of trigger, and that 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 was that was a another mind blowing moment of 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 this mouth, which is why I love now. It's not the only reason, but it's it's something that I I hold really important to have voice. Um, the other thing that we discovered when we were making this series of mats 
um, was we in accidentally invented a weave, which we call Mansao Ansao, which is to, to, to travel and to journey without knowing where you are going. Um, and, to tra and it's associated with madness. Um, it, 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 we accidentally invented it when we were trying, they were trying to achieve an optical illusion that I wanted to play with this lenticular effect. Um, and they couldn't quite achieve what I'd set out to do, but in the process, uh, we accidentally discovered this other weave, which is the basis. It's in the background. It's the it's the maze. There's no. It's not a tessellated pattern. It meanders. It's never repeated. Um, the other thing that I'm working towards now is the is the weave is very close to the digital pixel, the weft and the wolf, the the one and the zeros, and uh, ideas of uh, uh, pattern making. Uh, so I'm going more. The, the more recent work is exploring that the, the, the pixel of the weave and the, the digital. Um, this is the, the last slide from me, but it just shows two other works. The, the top one in the island is, is a bridge between the Malaysian uh, inhabitants uh, on the island and the stateless community. They're the same people, they're Bajau peoples from Sabah. Um, between between the southern Philippines, um, Indonesian, Kalimantan, Borneo, and Sulawesi. This is their their seas, uh, and although they share the same heritage, they're Bajau peoples. The 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 weaving is the same. There's great prejudice uh, and discrimination um, amongst the community. Um, the the bridge that you see there is uh, seven inches wide by I think about 60 meters, and it's an index, it's a dictionary, it's a count of, of, of patterns and rhythms and counting systems that, that form all their, their um, other weaves. So I think of the, the linguistics, the intergenerational multilingual um, motif that can be read, linguistics of the mat and of weaving. The bottom image is from the inland people with bamboo, that's a seven-headed uh, hat. It's a video. The, both of these are stills from video works. Um, and this idea that, and this is a morot hat. It's called a Lalandao hat, normally a singular hat. And I've extended it into this kind of rhizomic bridge um, um, uh, across many heads, uh, speaking towards the environment of the morot people, the jungle people. Uh, of, of uh, canopies and roots and reaching out. Um, and that's it from me. And I want to briefly introduce to you um, three films. So in my other life, I have many lives. I, I, I'm on the board of directors of Forever Sabah and NGO. I'm also on the board of the National Malaysian Film Development Council. Um, and my mandate is to help uplift um, Bonian or specifically Sabah cinema. Um, in Malaysia, we, we of course have a, a very long, very, very rich uh, cinema history. Some of you at Bamford may, I'm not sure, there may have been films here before, um, but there've never really been films from Malaysian Borneo. We don't, we're not seen, we're not heard, we're not, we're invisible in that media space. Uh, there's, this year alone, there's eight feature films coming out of Sabah. That is more in, than, in one year than the entire history of Bornean cinema in Malaysia. It is very, very significant uh, bumper crop this year. And I think it is, I think it is tied in with the, the need to assert ourselves and tell our 40,000 years of, of uh, figurative art of of telling our stories of 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 being present and 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 taking up space. Um, so these are three short films from three young filmmakers. Uh, Rama Rama um, is from Inland People, Dusun, um, made by Ikin from Kota Marudu, and uh, the, it, the little girl that you see in the post there is her niece, and the the film is made with her family. Ini uh, Bukan Telewat Raya, it's not too late to Raya, is made by Jeffrey Musa, who is the teacher at the 
tiny little school on the island where we work called Iskul Samad, Samadalal Omadal. He himself is a, uh, his parents were Cambodian refugees who settled in Malaysia. So he has been a very passionate and dedicated uh, teacher. So that, that film that in the middle is made by the stateless community. Uh, and people in that film were also involved in our project that you see on the wall. And then uh, similarly, uh, Putri Punama Sogwa uh, for the third film, uh, The House Without a Ground, um, is also a stateless community, but a more urban setting. And she grew up in a Rumah Stingan, or a squatter colony. So it's, again, uh, a filmmaker who grew up in that community and is very close to that community. And what I love about these three short films is that there, there's this honesty of origin of closeness to where the stories come from. And, um, and I really appreciate that about the films. So I hope you enjoy them. And I think Sherry will have a Q&A after the films. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I just need it. So <laughs> I'd like to thank Elon for her wonderful presentation and also for the chance to see these three very impactful films. Uh, and now we have a few moments for some questions. Uh, if you raise your hand, uh, there are ushers on either side of the theater who will come and give you a mic. Please wait for the mic, OK? Ilan. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So I have the honor of like, I'm a student. Where are you? Can you I'm right here. <laughs> OK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a student, and I work at the admissions desk, so I see like the art wall like every week. And I have the honor of like doing that. And like I feel like um, understanding it better it ha like, gives me a visceral experience of like, because like, I was raised in Indonesia. And um, I guess I was thinking back of my experiences with Meja and Tikar, um, table and mat. Um, like when I went to Sekolah Negeri um, public school, um, we all had these tables um, um, parallel um, facing the front um, of the class. And then when I was in Islamic school, we had this huge tikar in the middle and then we had tables around the tikar. And when we are doing our assignments, we go to the tikar. Um, when we are doing our exams, we'll go to the meja. So I just think like there's like, um, a mixture between Tikar and Meja in my experience. And I think you also mentioned um, how you see colonization, uh, like decolonization as like seeing the different powers of the Tikar and the Meja and acknowledging it. But I was wondering like, how do you see a collaboration between the Tikar and the Meja? How does the powers work together and how does it not work together? Where does it like diverge, I guess? Thank you. Um, we did a... Um Zoom meeting at the island with Victoria Song with Vicky um, when when it, for her to meet the weavers and uh, Vic, Victoria asked the weavers this kind of this question about the table and uh, Kat Rosia answered a good table is one that listens to the mat. That's right, right, Vicky? That's what she said. So we give, these are the notions of value um, that, I, that I, I spend a lot of time with. How do we give a table its value? You know, how do we, or, or, or power um, in, a, in a museum setting, what do we show? Who are the curators? What are their concerns? How do we tableify something? I often talk about the madness to mattify um, as a methodology. So I don't think it is necessarily, in, in today's world, I don't think um, it is an either or situation, but I think it is how we mattify the table, mattify our workplace, mattify our architectural space that we uh, call people to commune together, and in our methodologies of how we operate, yeah. Does that kind of answer? Yeah, thank mm. you. Selamat mm. 
uh, to Berkeley. Um, I found your talk very informative and, and comprehensive about so many uh, subjects, integrating the art into uh, the political and the historical, and that was gave me so much a better understanding of you. Uh, I have passed those mats so many times, and I thought, why tables? What is this about? So I appreciate so much that you've explained uh, the history uh, of this and the relationship to so much. And I also appreciate these films, which give us an understanding of the context of people who are undocumented really around the world and how governments uh, set these arbitrary boundaries that exclude people from education to which would allow them to escape their circumstances. So thank you for everything. Terima kasih banyak. Terima kasih, Maksuko, Monsiko. Hello, is it on? Yeah. Hello, thank you so much, Terima kasih. Yeah. Um, I was up the Mahakam River for four days this last year and going back to do a project in East Kalimantan. And um, between the Tikar and the Meja, one is solid and one is uh, mutable. One is transportable and one is, you know, not too uh, difficult. Um, I was just thinking of the riverside communities that I saw up the the big river. Mahakam is like the second largest river in at least Indonesian Borneo. Um, so how do you feel about the impending more urban development that's happening? Um, as you know, in East Kalimantan, and and how these more communities that can move with their tikar and might move upriver or downriver, as as needed for economic and other reasons. So, how do you see the symbolism of this large, rigid new urban development relative to what has been more of a fluid river, you know, based lifestyle? And that's a huge question. <laughs> um, I think you're referring to the moving of Jakarta from Java to Borneo to the new city of Nusantara, which is a, a new administrative center of Indonesia. Um, everyone in Borneo, Malaysia, uh, Borneo, as much as Indonesia, Borneo, is, is really um, nervous about it because we don't know what it might mean and what it what shape it might take. It's a massive Javafication, if you like, of um, Borneo. Um, the uh, uh, political, powerful, economic might of Jakarta now in Borneo. Uh, the thing about Borneo is that it is so much of a place of geography rather than of nation state. Uh, with the Dayak people being a, sort of a, an umbrella description of the many, many very diverse peoples and languages of Borneo. So there is a fear of this um, impending city. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who is a curator and um, in Indonesia, and she, uh, just last week, I met her in Hong Kong and she was telling me that the National Museums of Indonesia currently located in Jakarta will be moved to Borneo. What does that mean for us? Where is the Bornean voice, the Dayak voice? What does it mean to the landscape and the geography? It's so much unknown. Um, center of power moving closer. There may be benefits, there may be economic benefits. A lot of the labor migrants in Sabah will perhaps not move to Sabah, but perhaps will move to Kalimantan. So maybe we will have a labor shortage. What is the economic impact of that? Uh, so it is, it is such a huge, huge subject, worthy of many studies to all of the people in this room who are, who are um, engaged in that kind of thing. Um, but it's an unknown, really. Uh, but it will bring it will bring dramatic change because we've always been overseas from our power centers, literally, because we're they're located not on uh, Jakarta is in Java, Kuala Lumpur is in the Malay Peninsula. So it brings power closer, but we don't know the impact. Mm. Environmentally, there's also a lot of concerns. Um, 
yeah, conservationists are nervous. Yeah. Sorry, it's a vague answer because I don't know how to answer. Yeah. Hi, great programming. Um, I have a question in terms of the language. I've been noticing, um, you know, the first two, there are lots of local languages being spoken, and the third one is very Malay. Um, how is Malaysian government um, in terms of, um, you know, like trying to perhaps um, make the whole, I mean, discouraging or encouraging the local language being spoken or trying to um, malay everybody Ooh. <laughs> huge i i don't speak my grandmother's language well i've tried but i didn't grow up learning it because in the um 1970s um there was a, a massive movement to homogenize language uh to be malay um, as the official language i think it's why i don't know how to weave uh, because somehow I think of weaving as having rhythm that you learn as a, a child in terms of your language. And I grew up in a, a more urban setting. But also you have to remember, like 1976, Dewan Bahasa Pustaka, the, the, uh, the National Malaysian uh, Language, I suppose, Institute. Um, uh, the accusation is that they burnt the last remaining stockpile of Borneo Literature Bureau books in Sarawak in 1976 to discourage the use of the indigenous languages uh, by um, the Bornean population in order to homogenize uh, many, many, many peoples, ethnic groups, to become more Malay. Um, Nowadays, there is a, a very strong movement, especially amongst young people, to, to relearn their, their mother tongues um, and to be proud of it. Um, and it has, I think, also resulted in um, the growth of our visual arts and film scenes, actually, is this, this very strong desire to tell our own stories in our own ways. Ada orang semenanjung di sini. Hi. Okay. So I am very nervous to be talking on a mic. So um, I um I I'm Hapa, and I'm assuming you're Hapa too, based off of the photos that you shared. And um, my mom is from Wong Thai and my dad is Jewish American. And so from my perspective, they fall into these very stereotypical patriarchal and feminist dynamics and frameworks. And I'm wondering how that relates to you because like for me, my mom would be the tekar and my father would be the table, but that's reversed for you. And I um, read your interview, tekar as verb and your father told you that Tekar is like very feminist. And um, I'm just wondering how those frameworks have played out and how that has um, been informed and those identities have been influenced through your projects making the Tekars. Um, my, my being on this planet is a result of the um, of colonial history. So um, I should state that when my parents met, because uh, my, my father, who grew up in, in Sapong Tenem, uh, was educated um, by missionaries in Sabah. And when the British were exiting uh, their Brit uh, Bornean colonies, then Sabah was known as North Borneo. Um, as part of that decolonization process or exiting of these territories, they would send young bright students um, overseas for education. Um, it was called the Colombo Plan, Colombo of Sri Lanka. And they were set, these young people were sent to either Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Britain, or Northern Ireland, I think. Uh, and my father was sent to uh, New Zealand, um, where eventually, 
another story there, but he, eventually he met my mom and my, and, um, and they moved back to um, Sabah where my father didn't have a choice in what he studied. It was political science in order to be the first generation of civil service. So if you like, the civil service is the table, right? My mom, my mom's first degree was geography and then her, she's got like four degrees and a master's all in education. So she's been involved, uh, deeply involved in the setting up of schools in, in Sabah. And my father, when he came back to Sabah, uh, became one of the first district officers of Sundakan post-British. So first general, and my mom, all of 25 years old, with jean wearing, you know, protests against Vietnam War, my dear mother is expected to, to uh, make cucumber sandwiches for the, the the British colonialists who were still there and the plantation owners who were still in Sabah from, from Britain. So um, my parents are of a generation um, where, uh, the, where they were witness to the last of the colonial period and the, the beginning of a decolonization process. But my father was always very close to the Sabah state government. So in a way, very close to the table. And my mom being an educator and a, uh, um, someone who saw so strongly, my mom's, my mom's focus is on early childhood development. The most important thing in, to my mom for a kid in primary school is to learn one thing, which is to love to learn. That's my mom's ethos, right? So to me, that is, that is, um, it's a, uh, it's a really important thing that takes you through life. So I do think of the table as patriarchal, uh, hard power, and I do think of the mat as a kind of feminist, egalitarian, democratic, uh, democratic kind of power. Um, I don't think it is necessarily linked with. Uh, um, particular genders uh, in the sense of how you, um, as a descendant of, of, of mixed uh, uh, parentage, I don't, to me, both my parents inform me in very different ways. And also to, to see the power of the table as to how to influence the table. So it's, to me, there's this constant dance between the different kinds of powers and the different ways of un unpacking and, um, recognizing what power might be or can be um, and, and to be more equitable in that process and always calling people together as opposed to, to, to fighting. Um, one of my, I always talk about um, methodologies. So uh, you can see by the films, which is why it's also so important to show them, to show you context, is um, there's so much difficulty so to me, one of my methodologies is joy and play. And I think joy and play are underrated in this world, but they're, they're also very, very powerful. You know, we tend to equate power with uh, male patriarchal state power, but joy is power, play is power. So if we can, if we can utilize, put that into our modus operandi to, to, to play, the most important of the English four-letter words. None of the other four-letter words are any any fun without play, right? So, um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. It's a bit sort of vague, but it's, um, I, you know, sometimes, I mean, my, yeah, it's uh, both, both my parents inform me in different ways, despite them coming from uh, very different parts of the world. My mom's from New Zealand, did I say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, thank you so much for, for coming and joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, okay. thank, thanks again, Ilan. Thank you.